For our next speaker, we're going to deviate a little bit from technologies, but it's probably for technologists. So because we need more people in the space from all walks of life, and we're going to have like uh, Mark um, speak on it, Mark Hamalainen, and he's uh, running the Longevity Biotech Fellowship that uh, came out of uh, a merger between uh, OnDeck Biotech and uh, the Last Death Camp. Um, in the US, and uh, yeah, they're just trying to bring, I think, a million people into the space by next year, right? Ten uh, years. <laughs> ten years, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Mark, uh, the All right. space is yours. All right, so I'm Mark Hamelainen from the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. I've been working in biotech related to longevity for, I don't know, some 18 years, um, and I guess I saw the rate of progress going a little bit too slow. We went from having zero approved aging therapies when I started to still having zero approved aging therapies. And so I kind of thought to maybe take a different direction and work on growing the field. Um, so yeah, the Longevity Biotech Fellowship is a community to build, join, and invest in revolutionary longevity biotech projects. Uh, it is, like uh, Max said, a merger between two pre-existing programs. Nathan Chang, my co-founder, was running ODLB with Ada, and I ran Less Death's uh, Longevity Summer Camp with June Axup, and we decided to merge the programs together. Um, and what are these programs? So our target audience is mainly people who are not already working on longevity biotech. Um, and so... We wanted to get them into the field, get excited, get them connected, and also get them like working on high impact projects. Um, I ran a retreat called Longevity Summer Camp, and the reason I did a retreat was I went to an event when I was young that was one of the early SENS conferences, and it kind of just changed my life. I had, uh, before that event, I thought I was just this isolated weirdo, and then I met a bunch of other weirdos, and I was like, wow, there's like a community doing this. This is great. And then those people became my friends, and I started companies with them, and it was just a great time. Um, so I wanted to reproduce that. Uh, Nathan was running an online program that was like a sort of a 12-week program where you could get a crash course in longevity biotech. And that was also great because it was longer, and it provided an ongoing community. And so we decided that combining those two things, the, the sort of in real life, you know, sort of intense experience, social experience with like an ongoing online community would be the most effective way to get more people to work on this. Um, but why? So why build this community? Uh, because medicine is still pretty much in 20th century thinking. Um, who, so this is supposed to be a workshop area, so I'm gonna get interactive. Who in the audience thinks it would be great if aging was optional? You could just stay healthy for as long as you wanted to. Put your hand up. All right, that's all, I think everybody, except Chris, because he's working hard, he doesn't, he's not that interested. <laughs> okay, now who in the audience is working on technology that could plausibly significantly extend maximum human lifespan? Eh, I see a couple of maybes. I think there was one solid hand up. Uh, I'd say that's pretty consistent. There are very few people working to try to extend maximum human lifespan. That's very ambitious. Um, to make aging optional rather than to just, you know, marginally improve it or maybe sh increase health span but not lifespan. Um, we have a lot of people working on those things, but to actually extend maximum human lifespan, it's probably maybe a few thousand people in the world, maybe less. Um, so we need more people. And so Nathan and I are building a machine that prints longevity revolutionaries. That's what we call it. Um, there's going to be a big end of the funnel, which is an unlimited access course. Uh, we trialed that in Zuzulu last year, and we're building a high production value version of that right now that will be available to anybody who wants to take it. There will be study groups um, and, yeah, globally available, probably different languages. Uh, then we have the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. That's the flagship program. That's where you actually come to a retreat. Right now, there's two per year. Next year, it's probably going to be three, and we're going to have hopefully start doing a thing where we actually double the number per year and have them in broad locations. Because, again, we need to grow big, and that won't happen if it's a linear process. Um, and then the local chapters are a very important part of how we make this an exponential process how it works. So, yeah, you go through the course or the fellowship. 
Um, you started off as being somebody who thought longevity or maximum lifespan extension was cool, but you weren't actually working on it. You go through our program, you get activated, maybe you go to a startup, maybe you start a PhD, maybe you start a local chapter, and the whole thing expands. That's the idea. And we actually have our director of European operations right here, Roland, who's helping us expand to Europe. And our next, in May, we're going to actually have a, a cohort in Spain. Yeah, who should join? People who are mission aligned. And so people here maybe are already all mission aligned. But you might know people who are like interested in longevity. You might have friends who'd be like, oh man, it would be so cool if we lived longer. But like they're just working on some making widgets or selling advertisements. Um, you should send them to us. We can help them actually get to work on aging. That's what we do. Um, they don't need to have a biology PhD. Uh, we can take people with no bio background at all. Um, we, we have like sort of a diverse sort of set of uh, resources that we can give catered to people from different backgrounds. And we don't even think that biology is necessarily the thing one should work on. Like we take a very broad view of what we consider technology development for longevity. Like even increasing compute power by working on optical computing that would lead to better machine learning that would lead to better computational modeling. Like that actually is on the path. And so we take a broad view. Um, and yeah, specifically, we're looking for people that really want to work on this. They want to start, switch, or accelerate their career in this area. We also take mentors and sponsors. I think we have some mentors. Alexander right here is a mentor for one of our camps. And I think we got like, how many, how many people here have been to a LBF event? Yeah, all right. I think that's like half the room, actually. OK. Uh, force multiplier for the industry. So, so far. 1500 between we've had five cohorts between the different programs uh, 1500 applications one and four selected um, 50 plus people that have actually like started a company or changed jobs and that's that number is probably higher now because our survey data is out of date and I really like I'm proud of the fact that we get like a nine above nine out of ten net promoter score which means like would you recommend the program to a friend or colleague uh, just like some examples of uh, quotes, Mac Davis, CEO of Mini Circle, met with like uh, like a chief medical officer, physician type person on like the first day of his program. D. Who was working in a, a like a neurodegeneration lab and then switched to go work at Retro. Um, I think she got the job offer at the retreat. Um, Clara Fernandez, um, she's has the biggest longevity school in the world, I think. It's in Spain. People can go there to learn about longevity for themselves. Now they're doing a tech-oriented version in the United States, and she's hosting our next, uh, or one of our next cohorts at her property in Spain. Um, Ash Jafari is like an investor. I like this quote. For over a decade, I was watching on the sidelines and didn't think I could add value to the longevity field. The fellowship completely changed my perspective. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people that are like, this would be cool, to I am making this my personal mission. A um, few other, and this from Ellen is a good quote just to say that we take a diverse group. She says, Longevity Summer Camp was the most eye-opening, network-expanding, and awe-inspiring event I've had the pleasure of attending. Every person there was valued, listened to, and encouraged. Paul is uh, also another person who's gotten completely switched careers and is now working on longevity biotech. Roland in the front here also did not even know this was possible, I think. So, all right. and, uh, and also from our mentors and sponsors. So, but we have more, lots of mentors and sponsors. This is like half of them. I'll skip that. Ten-year vision. Yeah, so I think somebody already mentioned, maybe it was Max, about one million careers influenced because we this does have to be an exponential process. And so our ten-year vision is, yeah, not doesn't mean that we literally will handle a million people through our programs, but the cascading effects of what we do will affect a million people so that there'll be a million more people working on this than there were before if we had not existed. That's the, that's the aspirational goal. Um, 20K of people that are actually like pivotal people that like found companies or staff companies or labs or new organizations. 
And I showed a graphic at the beginning to show that longevity is less than 1% of biotech right now. We, we'd like to see that 10 years from now be 50%. Chris Patel is a big advocate for the, uh, the Gero hypothesis that we should be tackling aging itself rather than the downstream consequences. And I think the whole industry needs to shift in that direction. So yeah, we're raising an army to extend maximum human lifespan. Um, we're very much a community focused on getting people to work. Um, so we don't just do lectures. Uh, when people come to our events, we actually put them to work. We put some people to work in Berlin just uh, uh, yesterday, I think it was, or two days ago. Um, so we have all these community projects. The longevity course is actually a project that came from the LBF that Kat is leading. Um, we did a bottlenecks to progress survey, and we're going to make this an annual thing. It's live online, the preprint. Go to longevitybottlenecks.org, and you can see what 400 people in the industry collectively said were the bottlenecks to progress. Um, and we, the reason why we did this is because we want to be able to point our members towards high impact projects, help them decide what to work on. And if you can break a barrier to progress, that's a huge, meaningful contribution. Um, just a few examples, the top named one was validated biomarkers for aging. Because again, like we're, if we're gonna have aging therapies going through regulation, we need surrogate biomarkers, right? And so there's still not a consensus on what those should be. Um, overall lack of funding was actually number two after that. And the lack of models, models might actually be one because we broke it into two categories. But I could talk about this thing for like two hours, so we'll skip that. Um, we're also doing, a collaboration with an organization called Safe Forever, which is to spread the word. That's a part of building that funnel to make sure everybody who's interested knows they could work on this. Because actually, I went to a synthetic biology conference, which is the next slide, to test this idea that we have of going to non-longevity conferences and just setting up panel discussions and setting up a booth and just like talking to people. And it turned out at a synthetic biology conference, I would say 90% of the people I talked about didn't know anything about longevity or aging, like only the most superficial. And so like even in that group, which one might think is fairly close to us, people don't even know that this is something that you could be working on. Um, and the local chapters was another one of these projects. So these are examples of projects that our members get to work on. Um, if you're interested, feel free to contact me and we'll set you up with whoever is closest to you. Right now there's six major ones and there's going to be a lot more coming next year. Yeah, so join the revolution. That's what I'm here to talk about. And since you guys are probably already working on it, send your friends to us and we'll help them join the revolution. Yeah, I guess uh, when uh, Mark and Nathan and the entire team behind it succeeds, then uh, Copenhagen uh, needs to build like new halls that can fit all the people for the conference. Um, anybody wants to know anything from Mark? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. Well, uh, first of all, the reason I'm here and not upstairs is because it's, of course, much more ambitious not to work on the maximum human lifespan. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all interventions that are a continuation of what we already did in the 19th and 20th century. So while I think it's very useful for me personally, I'm sure, it's not very much appealing to my interest in science. This is, of course, much more interesting. But the question is, uh, did you guys consider the theoretical limitations here? Because if I look fairly superficial to the theoretical basis of aging as it is grounded in evolution essentially. There should be, according to Medawar, for example, an infinite number of causes of aging built into our genome since there's no selection against it. No? Yep. So that would imply that there's really nothing you can do about it. So you must have thought about some sort of exception or a theory that goes beyond that. I could think of some, but is sure. that something that your organization is doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we're orienting people to like how they can work on this mission. So obviously, we've thought a lot about like what to direct people towards. And I have my own personal biases, but that's why we did like the we do surveys. We try to aggregate information. But I'll give you a few thoughts on that. Uh, and this is like a technology panel which I got thrown into. So I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah, aging is super complicated. I like to think of it as this like 
networks of thousands of nodes that are all like little ratchets that are clicking forward and every time one clicks forward it causes the other ones around it to click forward faster so it's this exponential process that's just going off the rails and the idea that you could do anything about that is kind of extreme but the idea that you could do it by just throwing in some small molecules I think is also kind of strange I mean that's that's I mean I think we can get effects using small molecules but I wouldn't expect them to be huge right so how do you how do you how do you get rid of aging entirely? It's not gonna be with small molecules. Um, I would say that there are some examples in nature. Um, the difference between me and you and say a bristlecone tree, like pine tree, is software, right? So there are things that age differently, so we know it's modulatable, and so that makes me think that, oh, well, gene therapy, if we could actually learn how to treat genetics as software and get annual software updates with the latest and greatest genetics, that's one. There's obviously the damage, reproach, um, damage repair approach. And I think, again, um, genetic engineering is probably the way to go if you want to completely, if you want to more comprehensively repair damage. I mean, I think you can maybe treat certain types of damage with drugs, but I think most probably not. Um, so gene therapy, I think, is promising because, again, nature exists. There's things that live different amounts. We should be able to learn how to control that. Um, you can also do replacement. Uh, so we know how to make young tissue. When you make a new human being, it's, it's born young, it's not born old, right? And so we actually like have that example as well. And so you could, people are trying to do the reprogramming thing. I think there's limitations to what reprogramming will achieve in a somatic body, especially if you're using drugs. But um, we can also, like that's one approach to like harnessing that sort of natural process. But another one is, to actually just grow replacement parts. So you could imagine doing something fairly extreme, like actually growing a cloned body without a central nervous system and transplanting your brain into it, um, and then rejuvenating the brain using methods like Jean Hebert propo uh, proposes, because the brain actually, once it reaches full size and you're fully adult, it actually starts shrinking at about 1% per year, and you can actually add new tissue to the brain, and we know that it will incorporate it and start using it. So you could add tissue to the brain over time plus do a cocktail of other therapies to try to keep it healthy. So there definitely are approaches. I think a lot of it is buying enough time to eventually benefit from more advanced technology too, right? So like if you could do some mixture of small molecules, gene therapies, and replacement, and buy enough time um, that technology continues to advance, then you reach that thing called escape velocity that Aubrey de Grey has proposed. And I think it's, it feels a little bit science fiction now, but like in principle, I think the only question is how far along that curve are we? And I think the more people that are working on this, the faster we'll get to the um, elbow of the curve. Fantastic, thank you. Any other questions for Mark? Hello, um, I don't understand. So I, I see the what to work on, and I must admit I don't understand why validated biomarkers is so important for everybody at the moment. Especially, because, uh, especially when you know that in the public data sets you have uh, billions of uh, uh, validated uh, biomarkers uh, already, but that you cannot access at the moment. So that's my question comment. And maybe my second question comment is something I will say a few times uh, this day, those days. So that's about uh, this, the aspect translation gap. So you know that the maximal uh, human longevity today is uh, lower than 26 years ago, and that uh, uh, the average longevity now in the world is uh, lower than three years ago. Uh, so is that not one of the fundamental problems is uh, why is there this uh, um, decoupling of longevity science and longevity reality? All right, so for the first one, the validated biomarkers, I mean, I think validated biomarkers means getting it to a level of consensus where regulators feel confident, like, like the, way, the way we use LDL, right, and, and, and we take, I just don't think the, I think there's a lot of biomarkers that in research, in the research environment, people use for different things, and we, we like them. Um, but it hasn't yet gotten to the level of consensus where a regulator would say, oh, if your drug changes this biomarker, we'll approve it will approve it. 
And I think that's, I think we're probably actually not far away from that. And so I don't know if I would actually disagree with you. I think it just takes a bit of time for the institutions to, you know, work through this stuff. There's, and I, I do think there's a bit more research to do, like, because some of the biomarkers we use in research are really great when you're looking at populations or you're doing a study comparing one population to another. But I don't know that the, for instance, um, methylation-based clocks are very accurate for like a very a, a specific individual. I've heard from like even Vlad, Vadim Gladyshev himself will say there's like plus minus seven years when you, if you're looking at any given individual. And so it's, um, but that's a long conversation. Um, I think it'll get sorted out and I look forward to it getting sorted out. Um, the second question, um, sorry, remind me of the second question again. It was, Oh yeah, the gap between the research. So I actually think that there is a very large gap between building a prototype or demonstrating a phenomenon and then turning that into something that you could actually use in a human. And I call that the technology development problem. And I think the biggest problem there is that we have this whole academic field that loves like publishing papers when you've demonstrated something. Um, and then we have like a lot of funding at like the when things are very close to be being clinically useful, um, but there's this big gap in in between that I would call the technology development problem, and that's why we don't solve gene delivery because there's just it's too ambitious for VCs and it's too big for academia, and so there's this big gap where we're not funding the hard work of taking a demonstration and refining it and making it robust and repeatable and safe and effective. Like that's, who pays for that? Nobody wants to pay for that. It's hard, it's expensive, but it doesn't get you like a flashy science paper and it's too ambitious for venture. So I think there's a big gap there. That's, and I think that's why we have a translation gap. Yeah, and uh, Mark, I guess with bringing in more people, we'll solve that gap somehow. Let's first solve the people's problem, and then through that, we will solve the problem of uh, the All at the same time. We have and to work on every front in, of the in same parallel. time. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs>